Brought to you by Aiming for Jesus, Franklin County, Stories of Our Lives. The stories that make up the lives of our Franklin County, Mississippi family of people, from the current to the ancient, to the funny, to the uplifting. And now, here's Hollis McGeehee. One time he was riding along with one of his sons, Ed Jr., and they encountered a man who was really angry. In fact, he was so mad that he had his shotgun over his shoulder walking up the street of Butte, and Mr. Ed said, where are you headed? He said, I'm going to kill that old so-and-so. I know the names, but I'm not going to use the names. And, uh, Mr. Ed said, well, can I give you a little piece of advice? He said, yes, sir. I reckon so. He said, when you get there, he's going to take that gun away from you and beat you into the ground with it. And I would recommend you turn around and go home and cool off. That's how to stop a murder or an attempted murder. Mr. Ed, to everybody's knowledge, never carried a gun when he was a marshal imbued for many, many years. He was one of the most gentle people I've ever known, but I was asking Ed Jr. Zumbro about discipline in the home. He said it didn't take much of it. And it didn't take a lot when it did take some, it was mainly a look that stopped whatever was happening or about to happen. It would just, qu it would quit. And so Mr. Ed, just uh, one time there was somebody uh, robbing a store there, the furniture store on main street in Butte. And, uh, he, he took one of his boys that time with him. I believe that was Ed Jr. also, and he gave him a shotgun. He said, now you go around to the back door in case they try to get away. But Mr. Ed went in and, and solved that problem through the front door with no gun. And that's just the way he operated. He could, he could enforce the law with common sense and kindness and a lot of wisdom and no gun was needed. I knew Mr. Ed Zumbro senior as one of the kindest men I ever knew in life. I mean, he just, he would take time up with a young fella and you felt like you were as important as anybody else around because he, he listened to what you had to say and he paid attention. That was not real common with, with older people when we were kids growing up. A lot of grown-ups basically considered treating a child like a child. And Mr. Ed would treat you like you deserved if you crossed the line, but I never had to worry about that with him. He, was, he had my respect out of kindness. He was a wonderful man. There are other stories I'll tell about him, Lord willing, but I wanted to tell this one today. The man without a gun, didn't need a gun, had common sense, deep wisdom, and he knew the people and he knew the area and he knew how to handle them. Thank God for Mr. Ed Zumbro Sr. I want to tell you a couple of funny stories, but these aren't really jokes. These are true stories about people from Franklin County. So, the first one I want to tell you about is about the sheriff from back in the 1940s. I believe it was the 40s. It could have been the late 30s, but I think it was the early 40s. Mr. Jerry Reynolds, he lived up there. If you turn at the hilltop and turn right down the old river road, he's the first house on the right. You probably knew it more as that's where Joe and Tim and uh, Steve and Annie McNulty lived and their mama, Miss Joyce, and their, their aunt, Aunt Winnie. And so that, that was his family. He was the father of Joyce and Winnie and, 
I can't remember the other ones. One, one, one of them died uh, in a plane crash right there on the main street of Meadville many years ago, right after World War II, if, if my story's straight in my head. But anyway, so he was a sheriff, and he enjoyed having a really fast car, and he enjoyed himself in many different ways. And he would go over to Natchez on occasion, special occasions to – to have refreshments and and just enjoy the sights in the river city and sometimes he would run afoul of the law well he was the law in franklin county but he wasn't the law in adams county and they'd take in after him but he could outrun them he had a faster car and they'd chase him, and he'd get to the county line, and as soon as he crossed that Franklin County li- line, he'd skitter to a stop, and he'd jump out, and he'd say, all right, boys, what you going to do now? I'm the bow buzzer over here. <laughs> that was the end of that discussion until the next time he got back in Natchez and got chased again. Next story I want to tell you is about Brother Paul Parker. Uh, If you lived in the 60s and 70s and 80s in Franklin County, you certainly knew Brother Paul Parker. He ran the Franklin Funeral Home, and later it was he and Mike, I think, that ran it together. And They had uh, Steve and and David, just a fine family. Miss Pauline, they they were so well-respected and loved by the by the whole county and everybody that knew him. Brother Parker could uh, enjoy having a little fun sometime. I remember one time Mr. Hilton Zumbro, who was supervisor in District 3 for a long, long time, his main heavy equipment man was Mr. Ernest Mulkey, somebody else we all knew and loved. Ernest... uh, he had his own music going and he operated according to that music as each of us do. We're all unique in our own way. And he was under the weather and he was in the hospital and Mr. Hilton needed him out of the hospital and back on the motor grader. And he couldn't seem to accomplish that. So he, he enlisted some assistance through brother Parker because he knew that Ernest did not like the subject of going on to his great reward. I don't know what that was about. We could be concerned about that, but I'm not going to go there today because that issue has been resolved a long time ago between Ernest and the Lord. So Ernest was in the hospital, and knowing, knowing his sensitivity to the issue of death, Mr. Hilton, who had a great sense of humor, sent Brother Paul Parker up to the hospital to check on Ernest in a real special way. Brother Parker came in asking how he was feeling and how he's doing. Did he think he's going to get better? And Brother Parker pulled a tape measure out of his pocket and measured him across ways and long ways. And The story is Ernest got out of the bed right then. And he was back on the motor grader. It may have even been that same day, but he got his attention. I have some more Paul Parker stories I'll save and tell another time. I'm glad they can't tell stories on me. <laughs> I couldn't even begin to remember all the Vern Sullivan stories I know. One of my favorite people ever. I had more fun staying down there and visiting with the family and spending the weekend and hunting and just whatever we found to do, we just had a good time. And that was the way he had it planned. He'd say, uh, sitting at the table, feeding about 11 dozen of us. And he's got a large family, as you can see from the picture, but most of the ones that be there be all of the family plus some of us. And some of us would be two or three or four or five or six. So it'd be 12, 14 people around the table. 
And he'd say, boy, ain't this good. This is like camping out, isn't it? What, what he meant was we just having a good time. We just having a good time. So I want to first tell you, I'm not going to tell any more Vern Sullivan stories after today till I get a good picture. And I don't know why I don't have one, but I'm going to get one or get several. But I want to tell you first about his record as a lawyer. Now, not all of the really good top-notch lawyers actually went to law school or passed the bar because Mr. Vern was undefeated, in my recollection, against prosecution of his children for violation of the state game laws involving seasons and other things because see it down there on the river on the sullivan side of the river there was only two seasons and that was salt and pepper there was no other seasons uh what came out of those woods and fields and the river and the ponds and what flew in there and lit on those ponds and passed through that property it got, it got taken to the skinning shed and made into supper and breakfast and dinner and lunch and snacks. Uh, a lot of the food that was consumed at that table I was talking about was from those woods. So on one particular occasion, pretty soon after the new law, which it's a good law, but we resisted it pretty hard back then, about wearing hunter orange well the game wardens were waiting on him i don't remember which one he was an equal opportunity uh employer so to speak he would he would just as soon oppose one as the other he he was they were waiting on him one day we're not waiting on him waiting on bill and i think one of the other boys i don't remember if it was rex probably for them to come out of the woods at dark from hunting, see if they had orange. Well, when they came out, they, they didn't have any. And they said, well, we got it with us. We just took it off once we got through hunting. And so they wrote them up a ticket anyway. And so Mr. Vern represented them. And this is, this is my story and I'm sticking with it. So the prosecution had put on their case and judge Benoit at first, they heard it, of course, in justice court and, got convicted there but that didn't count because that that got appealed of course there's really not a higher court in franklin county than justice court but it got appealed to another court which had appellate rights from justice court the circuit court of franklin county and the honorable edwin benoit was the presiding judge at that time and mr Vern stood up to make his defense without even calling a witness. He said, your honor, he said, I understand you're a fisherman. He said, yes, Mr. Sullivan, that's correct. He said, I enjoy going fishing, especially crossing the river and going down the old river and catching a white perch and occasional bass. He said, well, that's what I thought. He said, now tell me, your honor, he said, when you're in your boat on the old river, the old channel of the Mississippi river, he said, do you wear your life jacket? He said, I do, Mr. Sullivan. It's a safety issue. And Mr. Vern said, I agree. He said, now I want to ask you something, judge. He said, when you come back across the river bridge from Vidalia to Natchez, do you wear your life jacket over there? He said, no, sir, I don't. He said, neither did my boys wear it when they come out of them woods. And I moved for a dismissal and the judge dismissed the charges. Uh, Mr. Vern's record is undefeated. I got a bunch more of these stories, but I want to get a couple of pictures before I tell them. Uh, I, I don't think I could run out of these stories to tell you the truth. And just uh, a wonderful friend that, love to tell stories about because he he didn't have to be funny i knew a couple of people in my life that they they didn't they didn't necessarily try to make you laugh they just lived 
and because they were so unique in their presence and in their presentation and everything about them that just them living was funnier than most people trying to tell a joke. The place where love blossoms in Roxy. A long time ago, Miss Carrie Graham operated along with her husband. I've forgotten his name. Uh, Ned, Ned Graham. They operated a boarding house in Roxy for many years. I still remember it in, I guess that would have been maybe 1970 or no, 71, I believe, the summer of 71, maybe the summer of 72. I worked on the highway department over in Roxy, and we ate lunch there every day. And I'm telling you, never has a finer meal ever been served anywhere than what was served at that boarding house. My goodness, just heaping piles of fried chicken and fried pork chops and every kind of vegetable, you know, those especially those good vegetables like black-eyed peas and rice and gravy, my kind, and, and trophy biscuits and cornbread and great big great big glasses of tea you couldn't even reach around them hardly you had to hold it with two hands i think i put on something like 35 pounds and grew an inch and a half that summer chopping bushes on the side of the road for cove campbell and eating at the boarding house every day it was some kind of fine i think it was like two dollars or two dollars and fifty cents somewhere in that neighborhood for lunch anyway they operated this boarding house for a long time now just to put this in a little bit of context mr cliff herring who i want to tell some stories about another time first wife who died tragically and i, I won't go into that today name was kate and she was kate graham and her brother was Ned Graham. And that's, of course, who Graham Herring got his name from, as I understand it. Anyway, Ned and, and Carrie ran the boarding house and just was a centerpiece of Roxy for as long as people can remember, especially people alive today and those recently gone on. And it was just a wonderful place to eat and a lot of gathering and, and good things took place there. And as I, my lead-in word said, love blossomed there. I'm sure there's a number of these stories, but the one I'm going to mention is is Mr. Aubrey Garner. I, he was from over in Louisiana. For some reason, I want to say Sicily Island. I'm supposed to know this, but I'm, I, I may be wrong about that. Anyway, he was from, pretty sure he was from Louisiana, and he was, I think, working offshore, if memory serves me right, from what uh, Carolyn told me. And he was staying there, and uh, he met Jimmy Ruth. And the rest, as they say, is history. They had a wonderful family, raised some good athletes, and and just uh, had a really good time with their family. They met with a lot of tragedy. But it doesn't do away with the, the wonderful times they had as a family. We know we lost Dale and, and a number of more. We just, uh, just tragedies. But that family was born out of a meeting at that boarding house or Mr. Aubrey being in, in Roxy. And he ran his station and Miss Jimmy Ruth was the postmistress and Mr. Aubrey was uh, the king of white perch fishermen of at least at least a couple of states, probably maybe even the world, and uh, and a champion saw saw man to to repair anything that needed to be fixed on the saw, and he loved to jerk those perches. Wonderful things came through that boarding house. Uh, we, we thank God for Miss Carrie and Ned Graham and the business they started that touched Roxy in such a powerful way. And we thank God for, for Aubrey and, and Jimmy Ruth Garner and their family. 
and we thank God that we're from Franklin County. Let's give thanks to God for all our blessings. Lord, thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to be born and raised in Franklin County, Mississippi. We thank you, Lord, that you have been with us and you continue to be with us. Lord, help us to be with you. Help us to trust in you, to rest in you, to find in you our all in all. Thank you, Lord, for these and many other people from our county who touched our lives in special ways, those that are still with us, bless them, and those that have gone on, bless their families. We thank you, God, for them. In Jesus' name, amen. This concludes this episode of Franklin County Stories of Our Lives. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, let's keep aiming for Jesus.